quick warning before I start. I have a long introduction today because I'll be talking about the Rasta movement in Jamaica and have so many thoughts about it as a West Indian person. So if I take a little time to wind up to my point today, I really appreciate or I would appreciate your patience. But with that, I am going to jump in. I need to warn you, I'm super excited about this topic today. So I really hope that you enjoy it as well. Let's get into it. In her book, The First Rasta, French writer Helene Lee critiqued the use of the word Rastafarianism amongst foreign academic scholars. Her critique resonated with me because it reflects so much of the themes that I'll center today's topic around today. Helene was a French writer and journalist. She wrote about the need for Western, in the case of who she was talking about, American scholars to describe Rastafarianism as a religion rather than a movement. To view Rastafari as a religion rather than a spiritual movement imposes a rigidity on the spiritual movement that, in my personal experience, I've never really witnessed amongst Rastafarians in the Caribbean for them to be as, let's say, strictly dogmatic as calling it Rastafarianism would suggest. Reading Helene's criticisms of the ism and her identification of the American academic need to sort of reduce Rastafari to a more rigid and highly structured belief system reminded me of an idea I spoke about in my first episode on the Belgian Congo regarding the origins of Cubism. For a quick little recap, Cubism, an art form that originated from and was unique to Africa, could have never arisen in Europe where the rigid perceptions of form prevented the fluidity required to create art that today we would call cubist. That was the general idea of that discussion. And so I think when we're talking about Rastafarianism, kind of thinking of the fluidity of belief in that way, in contrast to how, let's say, other people may want it to look, is a very interesting contrast. As a West Indian person myself, whose experience with, I guess, Rastafari philosophy and people colors much of my opinion and perception of the movement, I resonated strongly with Helene's critique of this rigidity, which forces a movement with many interesting anti-colonial themes into a colonial framework of looking at religion and spiritual beliefs. To compare Rastafari beliefs to Catholic doctrine or to force the belief system into a similar framework strikes me as uh, fundamentally misunderstanding the origins of the two and how greatly they differ. Obviously, there are many differences, right? And if none of this makes sense to you, what I've said so far today, welcome. It gets better. Don't worry, I'll unpack it all. My name is Arish, and this is the Global Black History Podcast. Okay, so today I'll be chatting with you about the first Rasta and the origins of the Rastafari movement, the basic principles of Rasta philosophy, and sort of the ideas which in my experience have been far more important to any Rastas I've known or met or spoken to or heard about other people's experiences with rather than holding onto a rigid doctrine. However, For most of this podcast, I will be trying to stick to the facts and I will let you know when I'm veering off course into conjecture or ancillary thoughts so that you can get the factual information and make up your own opinion. If you've always wanted to know more about Rastafari, as long as you're not like Ras Trent from the SNL skit, welcome. And even if you are a cringeworthy white guy, as long as you're not wearing a wig with fake dreadlocks, welcome. I want to talk about the aspect of Rastafari today that I find most interesting. I wanted to know more about the movement prior to Bob Marley, the person who comes to mind when most people think about Rastafarians. I also wanted to know more about the stigma many Rastafarians face in the Caribbean. Many people who grew up in middle-class Black families, although not all, throughout the Caribbean, 
may have grown up hearing many negative messages about Rastafarians. There is an association with crime, doing drugs, and a rejection of social norms that doesn't have the fun, sexy, rebellious connotations you may think, but have more antisocial connotations in West Indian society and culture. So I wanted to explore that. And I also wanted to know a little bit more about Selassie because I don't really know much about him. So we'll be talking just a little bit about him today in this episode. I've read conflicting information on the perception of Selassie amongst Rastas. So I'm going to share both my perspectives and just my anecdotal, I guess, interpretation of that. I won't go much into Bob Marley in this episode because one of my primary motivations for doing this is to specifically not talk about Bob Marley. No offense to him at all. He's just not who I want to talk about today. However, if you are interested in Robert Nesta, please find me on Twitter at BLK History Pod and message me about doing a second part. I'm 100% open to a part two currently, but I don't have any definitive plans of doing one soon. Okay, I promised this intro would be long, but I don't want to keep you here forever. Let's get into the life of the first Rasta, Leonard Howell, and the origins of the movement. Reading about Leonard Howell in Helen Lee's book brought a smile to my face that can only happen when you're a Caribbean woman reading about the cheeky, typical antics of a Caribbean man. I will leave that open-ended, but I'm probably not meaning anything malicious here. Uh, In Helen Lee's retelling of Howell's life, you can feel his charisma jumping off the page, and his personal context and background makes his future as a preacher and eventual spiritual leader make a lot more sense. Leonard Howell's grandfather was alive in 1834, when slaves won emancipation from English planters. Leonard was born in 1898 in Jamaica, but historians and researchers have had a hard time pinning down records and details of his early life. Like much of Caribbean history, there is a heavy reliance on varying oral histories to paint a picture of what Leonard's upbringing was like. And somewhere in the midst of these different stories lies a close approximation of the truth. Early in his life, like many Caribbean people in this era of colonization. Leonard Howell traveled abroad as a young man as a migrant worker. He worked on the Panama Canal, and conflicting historical records suggest this is where his travels began. He traveled to the United States, and in 1924, he made an attempt to immigrate to the United States and claimed that he was from Panama, not Jamaica, probably because that was where he was living at the time. There is evidence to suggest that Howell traveled to England at some point in the early teens and 20s, but left as the Great War broke out, despite the massive surge in pro-British nationalism in Jamaica, Howell didn't have the will to die in England's war, which makes a lot of sense to me, at least. Howell's path, interestingly enough, intertwines in some ways with Marcus Garvey, who founded the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association in Jamaica. I'm just going to assume that you've at least heard of Marcus Garvey, uh, and if not, give him a, a little Google. Marcus Garvey had a background that was somewhat similar to Howell's, but he had a more academic and professional path than Leonard Howell. An interesting point to note when it comes to the divergence in their philosophies uh, later in life. Traveling to Harlem proved to be the most influential part of Howell's travels when it came to founding the spiritual movement that he would eventually found. At the height of the Harlem Renaissance, New York was a hub for Black intellectuals. While some writers and thinkers dismissed the discussions of philosophy and politics emerging from Harlem at this point in time, and we know we know which um, people were dismissing them, Harlem bore a surge of movements conceptualizing or reconceptualizing Black identity not just for Black Americans within the United States, but amongst the different groups of immigrants that lived and came and collaborated in this part of the city. Some of the philosophies Howell heard about as a young man in New York 
influenced the principles of the Rastafarian spiritual movement. While Rastafari is a uniquely Caribbean movement, in the same way that reggae is a uniquely Caribbean form of music, the American influence on the cultural movement provides a very interesting, uh, you know, tidbit from my perspective at least. Traveling and interacting with different movements related to Black identity in this colonial era clearly had a major influence on Howell. And on a more personal note, I actually find the far-reaching effects of the Harlem Renaissance on the Black diaspora fascinating. You know, I think I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but I think so many times on social media, we're kind of pushed to see the divisions in Uh, different Black identity groups. And it's so interesting how, in reality, that a lot of good comes when we do come together and, you know, we make it a Harlem Renaissance and we spread it a Harlem Renaissance and that kind of thing. While Howell lived in Harlem, Marcus Garvey's association, the aforementioned UNIA, operated out of Harlem. And there were hundreds of thousands of enrolled Garveyites who ascribed to Garvey's philosophy of self-improvement of the Black race. While many radicals at the time considered uh, Garvey to be a charlatan who practiced what we might call today respectability politics, uh, there was no denying his popular appeal. Fair enough. Howell became well acquainted with Marcus Garvey's philosophy. So to provide a quick summary of what that is for anyone who's not super well versed in Marcus Garvey, Garvey's beliefs focused on African economic independence liberation from colonial powers, and advancement through economic and professional integration. There's obviously so much more depth to that and kind of who he was as a person, but I strongly doubt I will do an episode on Marcus Garvey in a good long time. So um, sorry, you'll have to you'll have to not rely on me for that one. I have so many more ideas I want to do first. In Harlem, Howell became exposed to Marxism. And while his later philosophies were not explicitly Marxist, Like Garvey's philosophy, Marxism at least influenced his views. One element of Howell's experience in Harlem sticks out to me, and I have a little quote here from Helen's book um, that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of collaboration and environment it was for ideas. And I quote, He had debated with the famous tabaqueros, Cuban cigar workers who paid people to read to them, newspapers, African history, novels, political essays while they worked. They closely followed new trends in international opinion and were often thought to harbor seditious ideas. Well, we know how people feel about um, Cuban revolutionaries out there in the world, so I suppose that has a long, proud old tradition as well. So I found this interesting because of the language barrier and kind of overcoming the language barrier to talk about and discuss philosophies surrounding your shared experience as colonial subjects. I also find it very interesting that these seditious ideas may mimic, you know, the idea that certain ideas are just completely taboo to talk about under your current government system is, you know, that's something that's been around for quite a long time as well. At this period in history, sedition laws throughout the British Empire, including Jamaica, silenced any voices that spoke out against colonialism in any meaningful way. So these conversations, debates, and philosophies reflected serious taboos that existed in Jamaica. Perhaps in going to Harlem, uh, that enabled so much exposure to ideas which would have been more closely monitored in a country like Jamaica, which is big compared to where I come from, but very little compared to the United States. It wasn't just that the subject matter was taboo. Sedition and treason were equivalent. And that meant in any anti-colonial public discourse you had, you there was the potential threat of serious consequences like prison time in minor cases. However, in general, treason was punishable by death in the British Empire. They loved a good hanging. When Howell returned to Jamaica... Laws against sedition seriously affected everything about Howell's spiritual movement from the beginning, all the way to the current stigmas against Rastafarians throughout the Caribbean today. Oh, yeah.
So our good friend Leonard Howell was possibly deported from the United States in 1932 for activities related to marijuana. But there's a lot of uncertainty about these particular facts because he never had a criminal record in the United States, according to the New York documentation. Eventually, the UNIA wanted to disassociate themselves from Howell's activities in New York before he returned to Jamaica, and as a result of that, many believed those activities were related to basically selling marijuana. Howell was definitely inspired by Garveyites, even if they distanced themselves from him later on. But what he recognized was that Marcus Garvey's philosophy didn't fulfill spiritual needs, and people were still looking for a spiritual aspect to their Black empowerment, so to speak. Marcus Garvey had the African Orthodox Church, but from the impression I got in my reading, this wasn't the biggest part of his movement, and it wasn't really that successful at recruiting adherents. To mention, to circle back to a point I mentioned earlier, this is what I meant when I said that their different backgrounds influenced their separate directions. Garvey was very into, like, the academic intellectual perspective, but Howell kind of less of a, you know, traditionally schooled sort of person wanted to focus on kind of like the spiritual, the metaphysical blackness of it all. He probably would have not put it that way. Um, those, those are my words. This is not historical fact at this point. But um, yes, you get the idea. There was a difference. They split apart. Reasons for Howell's deportation are hard to pin down, but it may have also been obia slash witchcraft, according to some rumors. At this time, there were a lot of kind of like fly-by-night witch doctors, it sounds like, or herbalists back in the day. And this sounds like it was a big problem. And whether or not it was a big problem, the NYPD was cracking down on the West Indians and their chicken blood and whatnot. Later on, though, Rastafarian philosophy would strongly disassociate itself with Obia. And since he basically came up with everything, it makes me a little doubtful that um, that was the reason, was for affiliations with something he really wanted to avoid. But then again, no better cover as an Obia man than to disassociate yourself with Obia. I mean, you know, this is overthinking it a bit, but he was basically deported. What is mostly verifiable is that he may have had an illegal healing practice, selling various herbal medicines, and there had just been many problems in New York with this because of a Jamaican ginger tonic that ended up paralyzing a bunch of people. So it worked, right? Um, I guess it wasn't supposed to do that. And so either way, he was deported and his return to Jamaica would represent the official beginnings of the Rastafari movement. So, so far, quick recap, because this has gone on 20 minutes in this part. And, uh, you know, sometimes we lose track of what the hell is happening. Howell was born in 1898. He left Jamaica to work and to travel in different countries. He was a part of the kind of Harlem Renaissance experience. And in 1932, he returned to Jamaica. And this was the year that Haile Selassie's portrait first reached global circulation. These two events coincided to ignite the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica. So before we get right into the Haile Selassie portrait and how everything got off the ground, we need to talk about another important person to Rastafari that bridged the gap between Garveyites and Howell's Rastafarian followers, the gateway drug. Athlete Rogers, or maybe it's Athlete. Oh boy, I'm gonna go with Athlete. I'm sorry, people. Athlete Rogers can be considered another co-founder of the Rastafari spiritual movement in a loose sense of the word. Uh, he wrote this manifesto called the Pibby, and I get the sense that this manifesto was trying to be something similar to the Old Testament. There were rules for dietary practices prophecies, economic analyses, a general code of conduct, and what the writer Helen Lee describes as soap opera, which I didn't fully understand until I cracked open the young Pibby myself. This manifesto viewed Ethiopia as the proverbial Israel. Now, in the Greek translations of the Bible, Ethiopia means land of the burned faces and used to refer to the entire African continent continent. I know. Sorry, people. We have to cancel the ancient Greeks. Luckily, time marching on got some of the work started for us. Um, Now, 
this is the context they were referring to before the Haile Selassie Association entered the picture. God's chosen people came from Ethiopia, not Israel, or not the, the area that we may currently think of today as Israel. I want to quickly mention a few contextual factors here regarding religion and the heavy role it plays in many of the Rastafari philosophies. During this time in Jamaica, not only was atheism massively frowned upon, but it was illegal. Not being a Christian was not allowed at all. Jamaica ran by colonial laws. In many Commonwealth countries across the Caribbean, our legislature and our little, you know, laws, act of tax act, whatever, uh, contain phrasing that pledges loyalty to the crown and to the Queen of England. In several different European philosophical movements, you get instances of philosophers espousing more atheistic tendencies. If you think of any famous philosopher from 1900 to 1930, right? When atheism is all but punishable by death, or at least by a social death, when you're already coming from a situation like being black in the West Indies, a hop, skip, and a jump away from slavery, where you have no capital and very little social power as at all, especially on an individual level, it is pretty easy to understand why social movements and spirituality became inextricably intertwined in a colony or any colony that had just emancipated its black population or Obviously, the British didn't just colonize black people, but anywhere else, it's diff it's easy to see why religion would be a part of it. So just a thought on that front and kind of like why there was such a strong religious aspect to think about. We're getting back to the PIBI now. This document contains some of the kind of run-of-the-mill gender division of labor and sexist thinking that you would expect um, from a man writing a religious text, but it's really not any different from any sexism you'd find in any other religious text. Uh, some of the verses were interesting, and I'll read a couple out loud today so you can get a sense of this document's, let's say, biblical rhythm and the underlying purpose behind the pibi, because I know you're not going to go look this up. I, I did it for you. Verse 18. Woe be unto a people, a race who seeks not their own foundations. Their wives shall be servants for the wives of other men, and their daughters shall be wives of poor men and vagabonds, and there shall be tears of deprivation. I'm going to just quickly pause here and say, their daughters shall be wives of poor men and vagabonds. And like, that's just, that's just a lot. Um, let's go into verse 19. 19. Woe be unto a race of people who forsake their own and adhere to the doctrine of another. They shall be slave to the people thereof. Verse 20. Verily I say unto you, O children of Ethiopia, boast not of the progress of other races, believing that thou art a part of the project, for at any time thou shall be cast over the bridge of death, both body and soul. Verse 21. Forget not the assembly of thou selves and unite, working for the upbuilding of Ethiopia and he generations. Verse 22. Then shall the nations of the earth respect thee, and thy commodities shall be for their gold and their commodities for thy gold, but there shall be none to fool thee, neither shall ye be their slaves. The Pibi, considered a proto-Rasta document, contains some of the general themes you'd find in Rastafarian philosophy. Like any patriarchal group, there's a weight put on protecting women and a preoccupation with ownership of women's sexuality. And you do find a strong reinforcement of an aggressively patriarchal mindset through many of these spiritual texts, which usually doesn't work out great for women in practice, but I'm just pointing out that, you know, if we're gonna compare, we're gonna compare, I guess. But there are some other aspects where I can resonate at the very least with the intention behind the message. If I, you know, try to say, okay, this is what I don't resonate with. This is what I do. Ethiopia in this document refers to all of Africa. And there is a huge anti-colonial message there where I can really respect how subversive that would have been. Um, he also says that Adam and Eve were basically both mixed race, which, I mean, quite frankly, it's never been done before. So credit where it's due. 
Uh, I understand why some of his verses may have been interpreted by, as anti-white, as presented by El Helen Lee, but I'm a little hesitant to broadcast that particular judgment because I only skimmed the pibby. Uh, religious texts aren't really my fave type of reading, so I will put a link to the entire thing in the podcast description so you know that I at least know where to find it. So I want to postulate for a second about the anti-white claims, whether or not they are true, about why this may have been the case given the social position uh, Black people occupied in the West, and while I question whether or not um, this is productive, let's say, for people in the West to practice and preach, I can at least understand where this may have been coming from. Uh, for what it's worth, the Pibi is banned in Jamaica and other Caribbean islands, and it has been since the 1920s, and I really can't find anything in it that's more problematic than any other religious text where I've gone and found, you know, the naughty bits. Um, in Ithley Rogers' defense, building up the British colony and wrongfully believing this would lead to riches for Black people in the Caribbean definitely accurately describes the journey from emancipation to political independence. And there is a sense of Black empowerment resonating through these passages that would have been very countercultural during this time period. But definitely other parts of the Pibby came off as very solipsistic, and Roger's attempt to insert himself at the center of a biblical narrative. So those were the pros and the cons. I really want to give you kind of both sides of things where, you know, I may be otherwise inclined to be strongly biased about, and I still probably am biased, but I want to try to be fair and kind of tackle uh, the biases and, you know, play both the devil's advocate and the heavenly counter advocate. Let's talk a little more about the man who wrote this document. Ithely Rogers. He was born in Anguilla, but later migrated to New Jersey. Rogers met with Marcus Garvey in Detroit, and the two shared philosophies and different ideas. Marcus Garvey, he be traveling. Rogers went to South Africa, where he founded a church that was active for 25 years. In 1924, the Pibby reached Kingston via a UNIA member, so, Garvey, so a Garveyite, basically, named Charles Goodridge, and shortly afterwards, as I previously mentioned, the Pibby became a banned book. So I'm going to challenge you for a second to consider why did they ban this specific book? What do you, what do you think the reason they banned it was? And I just, you know, decide for yourself, right? Okay, we're moving on. You've decided. Uh, I hope. You can pause if you want. The Pibby combined two branches of the Christian faith the millenarists, who were Zionists who believed in heaven on earth, and the Ethiopianists, who wanted to redeem the black self-image and syncretize Christianity with African spirituality. So this was kind of what Roger's religion was trying to do. In South Africa, he didn't impress many Zulus in the area where he opened his church. He mostly attracted foreigners. Zulus felt like they had a great sense of black identity and they had other churches to go to. Later, however, during the apartheid era, the Rastafarian movement would see a surge in popularity. Rogers would later turn to Jamaica, return to Jamaica, after shutting down his church, and his death is shrouded in mystery. He allegedly committed suicide, but much of the story recounted in Helen Lee's book sounds like his death was intentionally um, shrouded in both mystery and martyrdom to add a dimension of religious authenticity and drama to the spiritual leader's death. We're back to Howell, just returning to Jamaica now. Okay, we've got our proto-Rasta document sorted out. So we've got our Marcus Garvey, our Athelie Rogers, and now we're back to Mr. Leonard Howell. We are following him on his post-deportation journey throughout Jamaica. Howell returned to Jamaica in 1932, and one of the first things he did spoke to his character and what he was known for. His father gave him a cow upon his return, big deal, and Leonard sold the cow, giving half of the proceeds to the needy and using the other half to get his spiritual teaching off the ground. 
Howell met with Garvey in Jamaica, a confirmed meeting, where they discussed a plan to ally against the Jamaican establishment. Don't forget that we're dealing with a colonial government here, forced into emancipating Africans by slavery's dwindling profitability. The last thing a colonial establishment wants is any movements that mention anti-colonial sentiment at all, or they threaten, th or this threatens to make them lose their grip on the entire colony. Howell's mysticism and biblical references, his desire to tie in a spiritual element to the Black Power philosophy, resonated far more with Jamaicans than Americans, which is probably a huge reason that the Rastafari movement took off once he returned to Jamaica. Howell had various allies in Jamaica who helped crystallize his philosophy and supported him in his various disagreements with the establishment. Some of these allies ranged from fellow Black empowerment enthusiasts to men who had been tried for sedition for preaching about the Back to Africa movement. Uh, one of his allies was a semi-illiterate preacher named Ballantyne, who dictated a manifesto that contained many spelling errors and appeared to be difficult to understand. Ballantyne preached various colorfully prejudicial notions against race mixing and interacting with white people in general. I didn't hear anything in his teachings that literally advocated for violence against white people. So, you know, he was literally ahead of every former slave master's offspring on the island already. Um, but that's, that's my bias. I'm, ju I'm just gonna go out on a limb and be pro-Ballantyne when nobody asked. Uh, whereas I didn't see anything that stood out as explicitly anti-white from the Pibby, in my very quick skim, Ballantyne, like, he, he really was anti-white, um, all jokes aside. He preached more explicitly anti-white ideas, like, before I trust a white person, I trust a snake. Some of Ballantyne's writings decreed Europeans as overly liberal, and he generally espoused an ahistorical perspective of African conservatism. So where he thought that basically, you know, Europeans had taken away Africans' true conservative past, which is just completely false in pretty much every sense. Uh, I got the impression that Ballantyne was charismatic, but more interested in letting off steam about not liking white people while sprinkling in some black empowerment and back to Africa to spice up his ideological pepper pot. Finding allies didn't mean Howell would have an easy run. He was about to catch a big break in the religious recruitment department. Howell's general mysticism and spiritual philosophy really took off when news of a major international event hit Jamaica, the infamous crowning of Haile Selassie. Ethiopia crowned a new king, the Prince Rastafari. To Howell, this had great symbolic significance as a generally superstitious person and an advocate of Black empowerment. It is interesting to note that Howell's interest in Rastafari, for, in his own words and from the mouths of the people closest to him, was explicitly symbolic at first, or maybe like a mix, but it was explicitly symbolic for sure. The prince represented a very important idea that underpinned Howell's loosely constructed spiritual ideology at the, at the time. Rastafari represented the black race resuming their supremacy over Anglo-Saxons because they believed that this had once been the case, but thanks to colonization, white people had stolen this birthright. This was cemented by a widely published symbolic gesture where King George V of England returned a scepter looted from Ethiopia to Rastafari, which became the metaphorical passing of the baton of supremacy. For Howell, this also provided something to really ground his ideology. And from my judgment of the situation, I think he saw how this event could be used to his advantage. Good stories are the key to selling a message and to gaining believers. And Leonard Howell realized this. Rastafari's picture was published in the paper, and there was also a previous uh, 1928 Nat Geo spread about Ethiopia that portrayed Africa in such a benevolent light that to people living under the thumb of colonial rule, it wasn't such a logical leap to view Africa as a promised land.
1930, with Rastafari crowned emperor of Ethiopia and gaining the title Haile Selassie I, he espoused three titles, which added to the symbolic significance in the mind of Howell, who admittedly, as a mystic, would have been very likely, you know, looking for a sign. I'm looking for a sign today. Well, guess what? I'm going to see a sign. Selassie's official royal titles possessed a lot of significance for Howell, and later the Rastafarians that followed him. Selassie was the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Light of Saba, and Lion of Judah. I mean, Lion of Judah? Come on. Like, this wouldn't make you feel some type of way, like, I want to be a part of this. I don't know about y'all. I get it, right? I at least understand. The old empathy machine is working today. So we have Selassie. He was a king, a black patriarchal figure that black patriarchal Jamaicans could identify with. And, you know, so maybe some of them weren't patriarchal. I don't know them all, right? However, I learned in my reading, interestingly enough, that Selassie and the Ethiopian royal family did not consider themselves to be black. But I didn't dig deeper into that. I just found it kind of like, huh, interesting. Um, there was also the messianic aspect of Selassie's coronation. And that was kind of, you know, that is kind of what drew people to him. Uh, And the widely publicized image that was easy to identify with. If everybody has seen a meme, right, and you make your own meme using the same meme format, everyone's going to get your meme because you used the meme format. That's kind of, you know, how it works. Wow, look at my kid-friendly messaging here. The logical leap from Selassie to Messiah really isn't that difficult for me to understand, given some of the context I learned about. Um, First, Jamaicans at the time would have pledged allegiance and ascribed near-godlike powers to the King of England, a white man from a faraway land with no tangible connection to them. Christianity wasn't a choice, either. You just believed in it. You had to believe in a Christian God, and you had to believe in a Christian Messiah. And that Messiah was certainly a lot more conceptually distant than, say, a living Messiah who you just read about in The Gleaner. Transposing a belief in one monarchy to another, or from one Christ figure to another, really isn't that difficult for me, at least, to understand and to empathize with why that might be the case. In history, context is everything. I guess, like, probably there's someone out there who's, like, actually really into history and not just a girl with a podcast um, who, you know, could send me mean messages about that. But I do think context is a lot. And I find it interesting how the Rastas who do believe in a literal messiah, because not all of them do, are maligned. When at least they have, you know, physical evidence that their messiah existed and the actions that they view as symbolically restoring black power were printed in the newspaper. I'm not trying to come for anybody's beliefs. Believe what you want to believe. But I'm just saying that not every adherent of every belief system can speak about these aspects of their belief system with the level of certainty that maybe a Rasta who really believes in that could. So Howell had his messiah the glue that held his message together and differentiated his black empowerment from everyone else's because that's what you got to do, right? Do what's hitting and then put a spin on it. Howell understood something important, especially in an age and in a country where Christian sects were popping up nearly every week. There were many chapters about just the different random Christian sects that were popping up that I chose not to include. He needed something to differentiate himself And he was willing to go further than any countercultural preacher by committing treason. And since this is treason towards England, I respect it. Howell took the Selassie coronation and ran with it, okay? He ran, weaving it into much of his preaching. Uh, He would also preach in public sometimes. And don't y'all act like you don't do this because that's what a trending topic on Twitter is. And everybody's trying to get there their tweet off out into the ether. So he found the trending topic and he made a viral tweet. This appears, this kind of preaching in public thing, appears to have been a relatively common practice in the pre-television Caribbean, where men would stand around, they preach, they say things, and people would stop and listen to them if they found them interesting, funny, motivating, or what have you. Howell said shocking and radical things about Selassie, and I believe that would have gathered 
a lot of attention. I mean, just imagine a guy in the sa- the town square or whatever, and he's saying, the second Jesus has already come, and look, I have his picture in the newspaper right here. Okay. I'm taking, I'm, I'm listening. I don't know about y'all, but I'm listening. I'm giving him all my attention. He told people that when they were singing the national anthem, God Save the King, they should remember that they're singing to Selassie, not King George. Personally, I really don't see the difference in pledging allegiance to Selassie or King George, and I feel comfortable saying that it's worse to pledge allegiance to the empire that kidnapped and sold your people as chattel, and this part is definitely just my opinion. Howell spoke out against the churches, claiming they were corrupt and the priests were thieves, words that were clearly leading him down the path to getting in trouble with the authorities. He told people that priests and ministers were liars and they should stop going to church. He talked about slavery and how white men stole Africa and they should think of Africa as their home and not Jamaica. He also made, frankly, you know, ridiculous promises about various boats that were going to come to take black people back to Africa. One of them, he alleged, would arrive in 1934. But of course, that never materialized. And it's unclear whether most people took his boat proclamations that seriously. One thing I think people don't always get about Caribbean people is, you know, we may not believe the guy is coming with a boat to take us back to Africa. But if it's a good time, we may stand up and listen to him for you know, I guess hours. <laughs> um, I think that's, you know, that I don't know why people find that hard to believe that maybe people knew he was kind of BSing a little. Howell never had any interest in preaching hatred against white people because he believed that you only hate what you fear. And he found the notion of fearing white people particularly insulting. Despite the notable lack of hatred towards the white race in his teachings, Howell had done something much worse. He called for black social and economic independence, a brazenly anti-colonial message for the time period. An open call for independence? Surely the good colonial government must have recognized this trouble and for no ulterior reason decided that this is inherently criminal. Probably wasn't racism. Middle class and respectable black people didn't like Howell because they believed that this déclassé behavior would cause the hundreds of years of slavery that had already happened to happen. They wanted to integrate and assimilate into a white cultural value system, be respectable, acquire capital, remember that white people are the dominant race, pledge allegiance to a foreign white king, and think no thoughts of further freedom. But Howell went to the country people in St. Thomas Parish in southeastern Jamaica, and he found a lot more people willing to listen to him. People here were dirt poor, indentured laborers, growing in frustration at their living conditions and the situation they were in. There were a mix of Black people and Indians there, as in from India, and they were way more open to Howell's beliefs and desire for economic independence flowed freely amongst them. They were really looking for some answers. And so here Howell found people who would become the first Rastafarians. Howell's first arrest was for undermining the teachings of the church. And he was sentenced to two years in jail for this offense. An example of the fair and just colonial legal system. His arrest allowed his followers to view him as a martyr. So at least that was a plus, but it sounds pretty awful. In prison, Howell found another willing audience. Other prisoners. These people were willing to listen to his teachings. And, you know, I hear rumors that people in prison... Uh, you know, need a lot of entertainment because they don't get to do a lot of stuff in there. Uh, So then, you know, now they had a guy to listen to. By that time, his adherents differentiated themselves with long beards and with pins on their clothing that were the color of Ethiopia's flag, the red, green, and gold currently associated with Rastafarians. After Howell's release from prison, he found the first, he founded the first Rastafarian community, Pinnacle. The community comprised of roughly 4,000 people, with a flow of hundreds coming in and out every year. 
This community was fluid and not a specific compound, but an area of land where the Rastas lived and cultivated according to their shared beliefs and generally followed their leader, Howell, who functioned as more of a spiritual leader rather than a political one. So he didn't tell people what to do, where to go, anything. His main role was basically just preaching and explaining the philosophy. This wasn't like a cult compound, like, you know, Jonestown, where there's just Jim Jones telling people what to do. It wasn't like that. I don't know if you've ever been to kind of like country areas of the West Indies where a lot of people kind of like, for lack of a better word, kind of squat and they make a little homestead there. That was what it was, just different people who came and made their little homestead in the countryside. A Chinese man had promised that he would give Howell the land for this community in the countryside, but he never actually officially signed the documents. Uh, throughout his life, throughout this guy's life, Howell would form his community of the first Rastas, which would last until 1954. Howell's relationships with various powerful people in Kingston were probably the only reason the community lasted that long in the first place. Like I said before, he was a charismatic and likable guy. So even if the government, you know, was cracking down on him and all of this stuff, he still kind of knew people and he, he, was, he was known. He was a man about town. Howell's interactions with the Indians in the parish, who had recently arrived as indentured laborers from India, shaped some of the more mystical elements of the ideology he preached. He met and spoke with a lot of Hindus, and he meditated with them and learned from them. The Indians had just come, and I got the impression that basically the Black people in Jamaica were really looking forward to it and were super interested in them. I don't know if you know a lot of West Indian people, but West Indian people are very curious about other people's cultures and the way they do things. And they're also not afraid to ask questions and to get their questions answered. So all the Indians were coming and they had their really different from Christianity spiritual beliefs. And Howell really liked that. He would sit and talk with them for hours and he meditated with them and he learned from them. And two of the practices we associate with like the stereotypical Rasta image came from what Howell learned through the Hindu Indians who had just come to the island. There were already a lot there was already a lot of cultural mixing between black people and Indians because as the Indians came to Jamaica, it was mostly Indian men. So they typically married black women because who else they gonna marry? And they'd become integrated into the community. So the Hindus used marijuana, which I think they call bang as part of their spiritual practice, and Howell introduced the spiritual usage of marijuana into Rastafarian practices from his experience meditating and learning from the Hindus. Hindu spiritual leaders grew out their hair in dreadlocks, and this was how that became a part of Rastafarian identity in Pinnacle. And so here is also another segment of this general theme, what Helen Lee quotes about the salutation Ja Rastafari, another aspect of Hinduism that became interwoven into Rasta beliefs. One can hear the loud chants of Jai Bhagwan, Jai Rama, Jai Krishna, Krishna or Jai Kali. Victory to God, Rama slash Rama slash Krishna slash Kali. At any private community, any private or community Hindu puja or prayer meeting, as Rastafari gained the stat status of African lords, Rama slash Krishna, during the 1940s, phonetic usage of the word Jai was continued, but Rama, Krishna, and Kali were replaced by Rastafari. Searching the Old Testament, the Rastas found the word Ja, which is phonetically similar to the Hindi word Jai. And so they essentially used that word because of the Hindus, finding evidence for it in the Bible, took that to, you know, use in the salutation, Ja Rastafari. So that's, a, the, I found this part, honestly, I had to just close the book. I was just like, close the book. Wow. You know, we're, I think so much happens when people come together and, you know, without being too corny, I'll just end that there because... It could get it could get dark by being too sentimental. A vegetarianism became a part of the Rasta lifestyle because of the vegetarian Hindus. 
This was partly because in Indian kind of like medicine practices, I think like, you know how you see these memes that are like Ayurveda cure. Um, in Indian medicine practices, they believe that consuming meat has harmful effects when you consume cannabis as well. So Rast has adopted this. In many cases as well, certain Hindu practices offered an alternative to colonial ideology that didn't run the risk of getting the, quote, anti-white label or turning into a philosophy of hate. Howell had a generally non-violent approach. He found the ideas of karma and reincarnation really fascinating because, again, he was, like, talking to people. So he would ask them, you know, what what's karma? What's reincarnation? They'd explain. And he found it really interesting. And he integrated some of the teaches, teachings into his earlier preaching. Now, this didn't necessarily stay throughout. However, when Rastafarianism spread to the ghettos of Kingston, so the city instead of the countryside, it became a part of the tradition to venerate Indian elders the same way that you did Rasta elders. So there was some type of awareness that like an old Indian man is kind of has a position of respect for Rastafarians as well. While in prison, Howell even wrote under an Indian pen name, which I realized I should have probably written down to read to you, but I did not. Sorry. He'd been arrested for sedition, so this Indian pen name it, uh, would also kind of blend with his other nickname, Gong, which according to Helen Lee is Jamaican slang for a tough guy. Howell was notoriously fearless, and he didn't need violence to basically remain fearless. Uh, he went, everybody knew him as a tough guy anyways. And so the name Gong, uh, some of you may realize if you're reggae fans here, which is why I brought that up. And we'll circle back to the Gong thing at the end. But he took this Indian pen name, not just because he was trying to um, get canceled for cultural appropriation on Instagram, but uh, because he had that really strong influence from the Indian guys who he, you know, talked shop with. Unfortunately, while in jail, there was a schism. A, oh boy. That moment when you realize you don't really know how to pronounce a word. A, let's call it a, a schism. There was a schism amongst the Rastafarians, a sect called the Nyabingis, which means death to white people. Um, this philosophy was anti-white. Uh, unfortunately, their existence in Ethiopia, the Nyabingis, was a myth invented by a fascist Italian propagandist when Mussolini planned to invade Ethiopia. So basically, in Jamaica, they heard about the Nyabingis thinking like, oh my God, like this is a real thing, like a death to white people group in Ethiopia, but it didn't exist at all. A fascist propagandist made it up to fool, Ethio to fool Italians. Philos, the propagandist, claimed that Selassie had a legion of millions of these Nyabingis behind him. And this unfortunately led to a schism of Rastas who viewed Selassie as the messiah of black empowerment to form the sect based on racist propaganda written by a white man. Short version. I'm not going to read much about them, but I didn't want y'all to think I don't know because I'd be knowing. Um, so I'm going to read the quote that summarizes the sect and reiterates a bit of what I just said. And so began the first Rastafarian schism, only two years after its inception. The main difference between the Rastafarais and the Nyabingis stems from the fact that the founding text of the Nyabingis was virulent racist propaganda written by a white man preying on white paranoia. There is a huge divide between the black redemption of the Garveyites and the race war that Philos fantasized. Garvey had, one must admit, denounced miscegenation, philosophy and opinions 1, page 16, but only as a struggle against the pernicious practice of heightening skin color by marriage, an instrument of human devaluation. But Garvey, by re-evaluating the black image, restored to his people pride in their appearance and identity, and taught them that their fate was in their own hands. Philos's aim was malevolent. I think that gets to the point here where she, people aren't just saying that they were anti-white to be like trendy and criticize them. Like there, this difference in philosophy really underlies it. And I think it's important to talk about this when we're talking about what did Leonard Howell preach versus who are these people who made fringe, right? 
After the schism, the main Rastas didn't have much to do with this ideology at all. And more or less, ju they just kept living their lives in Pinnacle until the 1941 police raid. The, as I said, the last one was in 1954, but the police would pull through every once in a while and, like I say, do a state violence um, to the people. Uh, these police raids usually ended with police burning marijuana farms. Marijuana grows relatively easily, I've heard, and the crops represented both a spiritual necessity for meditation and economic empowerment for poor rural people who could sell marijuana to people who are not Rastafarians and make money to subsist. I personally do not view that as more immoral than selling our beach lands to foreign developers to, you know, dump sewage into by the gallon, but different strokes for different folks. The raids were often timed politically, and corrupt police took advantage of the raids to loot the Rasta community. Like I said, they did a state violence. Illegal possession of firearms represented another cited reason for the frequent police raids. Despite Howell's professed nonviolence, and many other people professed his nonviolence too, this ain't a rumor, their marijuana crop opened the Rastas up to outside violence from people involved in like serious and international drug operations who didn't want, you know, these country people's competition. There was also potential violence for people who might have been looking to steal from the community, just, you know, fly by night people who wanted to, you know, come and cl clip all their flour or what have you. However, the objections to the Rasta communities on paper were very different from reality. And you definitely got the idea from other instances of Rastafarians being assaulted because of their pins, their hair, their beards, that this was a community that you could basically pick on and the police wouldn't do anything if you decided to beat up a young Rasta male or to attack a group of Rastas and stone them. That was fine, basically. The Jamaica Gleaner published as much slander as possible about adherence to the Rasta movement. They were maligned for being atheists. Oh no, they were maligned for being treasonous, not King George. Rastas became the boogeyman for anti-colonial anxieties about Black empowerment. And the Black people in the country who believed distancing themselves from the Rastas would lead to a better personal outcome in their own struggle under colonialism were happy to distance themselves from the Rastas and participate in what often amounted to outright discrimination and in many cases violence. We don't like to talk about when people are just doing mob violence, but honestly, destigmatize, normalize talking about mob violence. When did it stop? Gangs would commonly pick on Rastas, easy because of the way they dressed and their locks. They would cut off their locks not to turn them away from crime, but because dreadlocks violated proper colonial standards of conduct for Black people. Many of the gangs and groups that attacked Rastas were white. Yeah, imagine that. White yardies. They didn't like Rastas because they were Black. They were proud to be Black. Rabble-rousing in their preachings about independence and Black power. You know, there were people doing racism, people. I, sorry to be the one to tell you. Every stereotype about Black people in the book became magnified when newspapers reported on the Rastas who became symbolically equated with anti-colonial thinking of any kind and then associated with criminality and stupidity. There were clear reasons why the Jamaican establishment wanted the Rasta leader, Leonard Howell, to shut up and go away. None of these reasons stood on particularly sound moral footing and all had a political agenda since the police often participated in unlawful violence against the Rastas and stole their crops to sell from them themselves. Sold their crops to sell for themselves. So clearly they didn't have a big moral issue if they just took it to go sell for themselves and, you know, fatten their own pockets. The 1941 raid reduced Pinnacle's population, but the rural agrarian community wouldn't fall apart until 1954. A series of other events involving land ownership disputes, a good West Indian favorite. Raise your hand if you're West Indian and have never been party to a land ownership dispute. Uh, I will not be able to see it because this is a podcast. But this led to the Rastas giving up their land and scattering throughout the shanty towns in Kingston. 
Until then, Rastafarians had been a rural movement, and their association with Kingston and urban poverty began with the end of the pinnacle community in the countryside and with the international rise to fame of a young man growing up in Trench Town, Robert Nesta Marley. Bob Marley proclaimed himself as tougher than gong, and he is the main figure that we associate with Rastafarians today. It may surprise some listeners that I'm stopping this podcast right at Bob Marley. This is kind of, this is the new info for the day, everyone. He's the most famous Rastafarian internationally. But I find the Rast, the origins of Rasta beliefs far more interesting than a run through of Bob Marley's life, which you could probably read like the several biographies, including the famous one Catch a Fire about, or if you're interested in a fictionalized version, the talented Marlon James has a book called A Brief History of Seven Killings, which will get you through that night quite nicely. Uh, If you're interested, however, in an episode about Bob Marley, I'm open to writing one, but I currently don't have any plans to do so. Just keeping it real, keeping it honest. If you'd like to hear about it, the best place to give me input on my ideas is Patreon, where you can now get early access to episodes, text version of episodes that are easy to read, and behind-the-scenes posts limited since this is like my sixth podcast so far. Seventh? Girl, you know I can't count. If you're willing to chip in for a coffee so I keep doing this research, you can subscribe and keep me sorted on Patreon at www patreon.com forward slash black history pod if you want to find me on twitter you can at blk history pod uh i mostly just put tweet about the podcast and like i'll reply to you if you message me but that's the only reason i have it so i won't be canceling or dragging anyone now we have that out of the way i do have a few closing remarks about this story and some lessons i got out of my research or new insights i had on the story of rastas throughout the caribbean so this conclusion like stick around because i'm gonna kind of get into like the huh, i never thought of it this way part of stuff many critics of rastafari let's say focus on the selassie as messiah part of the movement And as Helen Lee and other scholars mention, the genuine belief in Selassie as Messiah is highly variable amongst Rastas. And I do agree with that. Like, you'll meet some people and kind of they'll be talking to you about their locks or like, you know, their vegetarianism or what they think. And not every time does Selassie come up. And again, this may be a generational thing because I am you know, I'm not 50 or something. And like, maybe if you're 50, like they're super into Selassie and I just never met them because they wouldn't talk to me. Many critics focus on this, right? And people act like this is a group of believers who are basically have a Catholic dogmatic focus where like, if you don't believe that Selassie was the Messiah, like you can't be a Rasta. And it's like, well, it's not like there's a registry or anything. I'm pretty sure you can just say that you you know, just like say whatever you want and be it basically. Uh, You know, I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of definition, but it's a little more variable than we may think is my point. And there's a lot of openness to interpretation and not very much dogma, despite the various texts that have gained an association with Rastafarians, I find that the reality is a lot more fluid. So I just wanted to address that belief. It's not like how all Christians believe Jesus died on the cross. That's not really how it is. It's different. Uh, There's still a lot of stigma against Rastafarians in the Caribbean. Helen Lee talks about this a lot in her book with regards to Jamaica, but in my anecdotal experience, this exists in St. Lucia as well, and I've heard other islanders talk about it. Uh, A lot of people I know also have like Rastas or parents with locks. So maybe in that context or if you know like someone close to you you may not even know a lot of some of like what is going on in our families behind closed doors and what people say but like if you know you know and like I'm not gonna come on here and put people's names and through the mud or anything but there's definitely negative stigma let's say that I find a lot of the criticism is honestly highly racially motivated that Rastas face more social discrimination in black countries than foreign missionaries who have black inferiority embedded in their doctrine and are considered genuinely dangerous cults 
around the world, like a part of what we would consider, oh, this is a toxic cult. That's fine. But people have a lot to say about Rastafarians. I'm not a Rastafarian um, in any sense of the world word, really zero sense. Um, but I wanted to tell a story that just kind of balanced some of the negative stigma, but doesn't romanticize this spiritual movement. Uh, some aspects of Rastafarian beliefs would have definitely changed from the time when I'm ending this story. And that's like not what I'm speaking about. In 1954, especially like from 1954 to now, I'm sure a lot has happened. But I wanted to tell the story of the original Rasta community. The book Chant Down Babylon claims that no two Rastas will describe what it means to be Rastafarian with the same language. And I find that to be true. And in my perspective, this represents a big difference between Rastafarians and many other religious beliefs that require adherence to a specific doctrine for you to be a part of them. I wanted to examine some of the origins of some of the stigma against Rastafarians and where these negative beliefs come from and why they originated. If you're a Christian, let's say, who believes that anyone who isn't a Christian is inherently evil, that will basically shape how you view people who aren't Christian, right? And if you believe that any spirituality that deviates from the religion taught by colonial powers is inherently positive, then that bias will shape your perspective as well. And I don't necessarily believe that because something is anti-colonial, it's inherently positive, which is probably, uh, you know, smart for women to kind of like think about this one extra hard. It is okay to have perspectives and differences, but hate and discrimination in workplaces, schools, and social settings should never motivate people to treat others like they're less than human or to use somewhat valid concerns as kind of like a way to cloak their prejudices and the actual reason that they allegedly care so much. So that is what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to kind of present, you know, I'm not a Rastafarian. I don't believe in any, you know, doctrine uh, affiliated, let's say. Uh, but I wanted to give you kind of like, huh, think about it this way today. So I hope I've done that. I hope you learned something new in this episode. I hope you, huh, never thought about it that way about the entire subject. I had a blast researching. I probably talked way too fast. Uh, don't forget to check out my Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Black History Pod. And follow me on Twitter at BLK History Pod. See ya.